Now, some things are clear. They are written, don't do this, do this. Seek this first, don't seek this. Those things are clear. Some things are a little cloudy and call for guidance and understanding. And as you go along in life as a leader, your choices sometimes are not between good and evil, they're between good and second best may not even be evil, but not right for the situation you are dealing with as a Christian leader. And you're trying to decide, Lord, what is your will regarding this? What is your decision? What is your choice? How can I, as your representative leading in the context where you have placed me, make the right choice. Have you ever had, of course you have, situations where you wondered what you should do? Now, it wasn't a moral choice. I mean, you knew you should keep your life pure, so the choice of sinfulness is not the option. <coughs> but the choice of right for you and for the situation is an option. That goes beyond your understanding. Teach us to number our days that we may apply our heart to wisdom. Help me to make the right choice. I remember when I proposed to my wife. Uh, what better place do we have question marks sometimes than in regard to when I choose a mate to commit to for life in a holy situation of marriage who will become the spouse with my children, who will become my partner for all time on earth, <clears throat> who will be blessed by me and in turn will be a blessing to me. What a big question that is. What a hard decision to make. It was certainly hard for me. Would you like to hear it? <laughs> <coughs> we have been married, you know, for quite a while now. 51 years. So that's a while. <laughs> Do I regret the decision? No. Why? Because I made the right decision. Was it an easy decision? No. It was a hard decision. Matter of fact, in the circumstances, I did not want to get married. I was young. I had mountains to climb, places to go, things to do. Don't interrupt my plan. And guess who came along and interrupted my plans? Yes, my wife. We met on the cold streets of Chicago. <laughs> we were doing good things. You know what we were doing? We were working on the streets of Chicago to bring the gospel to people who were homeless, many of them alcoholics, many of them with lives that have crumbled. A rescue mission. There are some of those around here you probably know about that. People coming in to try to share with them. Well, we were on a team together. And I was there with all of my plans for the future, which said, thank you, Lord. No marriage for me for a while, <laughs> at least. Don't let some little female turn me aside from the will of God. And unfortunately, and I, I was telling God, 
rather than listening to what he told me. Well, we began to serve. My wife happened to play the piano. Oh, I always wanted a wife who could play the piano. My lack of musical ability, I needed help with that. Especially if I was going to be a missionary, and I was. She played the piano. I thought, wow, that's a nice thing. <laughs> Besides that, she's pretty. <laughs> I'm sorry, God. That was flesh, not spirit. <laughs> Don't let her turn me aside from serving. The weeks went on, the months went on, we were in training, and lo and behold, I found myself weakening at the knees and all the way up. And finding myself looking for her, and something was happening inside, and I was repenting after every occasion when we went out to minister for this distraction from the will of God. And the time came on one occasion where it happened, and I said, would you consider marrying me? <laughs> I could not believe I actually did that. I had sinned greatly. Surely that was the case. <laughs> Unfortunately, I thought, she must be going to say no, but she said, yes. <laughs> and I said, really? <laughs> and from there, things developed, and I spoke with her family, and the relationship began go moving toward a planning stage. And I still thought, am I doing the will of God? Is this from him? And I actually tried to repent. <laughs> and on one occasion, I was down on my knees before him, saying, God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> he said, get up, stupid. <laughs> And he said, did I not lead you to do this? Was your heart not right with me when you made this decision? And when these things moved to this occasion, and I had to repent of my lack of trust in God, that if I guard my heart and keep myself pure, he will not let me miss the will of God. Now, some of you are much more sensible and sensitive, and you don't do stupid things like that. <laughs> and I have no regrets for the leading of God. Why? Because purity of heart says you will see God. You will see God in your past. You didn't know it, but he was there. Like Hagar and Ishmael of old, running into the desert did not help them escape from God. He was there. He saw your past. Someday you'll see it. God was there. See God. He will see you in your present. He got you here. And on a daily basis, He wants you to see Him. And yes, He will see your future. You will see Him then, now, and hereafter. Ultimately, you will see him 
perfectly. Not until that second coming that I was talking about. When your eyes are truly given to see. But if you are pure in heart, you will see God. The greatest privilege you could ever have. Now, as a Christian leader, you want to see God. You want to see him working in the situation he places you with the responsibilities that he gives you. You want to see him become the object of affection of the people that you work with. You want to see him as the provider who is taking care of everything related to his people in the midst of a fallen world where many things go wrong. You will see God. You'll see his glory in sovereignty. You'll see his glory in guidance. You'll see his glory in destiny. You will see God. What could be better than that? Now why would he choose something like this to teach his disciples? When you get to the end of this passage in Matthew 5, he has two things to say in regard to why he delivered the sermon of the eight or nine Beatitudes. And this is what he says. It's really pretty simple. You are salt. You are the salt of the earth. God is calling you to be salt. What is salt? It's a preservative. That's what it is. It holds back evil. Your decisions will help hold back evil. Unless you choose to participate in it, then it's just the opposite. And that would be disapproved. Secondly, he says, you are light. Light. What does light do? It pushes back darkness. Why can't people see God? Too much darkness. What is your life going to accomplish? Push back the darkness. Preserve that which is right. It puts it all in context. Teach us to number our days so that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. And be blessed, pure in heart. Let's pray together. Lord God, there's so much to be said about seeing you, and we thank you. That once we have made the choice by your grace to accept Christ, we are safe in the very palm of your hand. And our destiny is secure. Our current circumstances is blessed by your presence. And even our past, scarred and broken as perhaps it was, is seen in the light of your sovereignty. Because in the end, you will reign. Lord of Lord and kings of, King of Kings. So we ask you to keep us pure so that we might see you fully along the way. In Jesus' name, amen.